Good morning. My name is Tino Cuellar, and I'm the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. The Carnegie Endowment was created at the start of the 20th century, a very tumultuous time, as a new kind of organization that could use knowledge and ideas to reduce conflict and increase effective cooperation across borders, across governments. When we tell the story of geopolitics in that century, the 20th century, we often focus on major security events, the two world wars, the development of nuclear weapons, the Cold War, regional conflicts, the creation of global institutions dedicated to reducing armed conflict. But this story is incomplete if we don't also discuss changes in global prosperity and in the economic order that emerged in parallel, sometimes in close connection with these security developments. Global life expectancy has risen from less than 47 years in 1950 to 71 years in 2021. The male-female gap in primary and secondary schooling globally has almost disappeared. Even just between 1990 and 2010, the percentage of the population living in extreme poverty around the world plunged from about 72% by most accounts to 14%. And this all played out in parallel to the growth of a global trading regime, the creation of international economic institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, and the dominance of certain ideas about the right way for economies to grow. Today, the world is experiencing what our guest has called a polycrisis that tests every part of the economic order. Russia's war in Ukraine has triggered massive spikes in the prices of commodities like metals, grain. Ongoing tensions between the United States and China could lead to as much as a 2% decrease in global output, according to the IMF. In the face of climate change, Experts expect that the global energy transition will cost approximately $4 trillion a year over the next decade. And of course, deepening economic inequality around the world has raised fundamental political questions about how best to harness markets, but also public policies to provide sustained improvement and well-being for everyone. Individually, these challenges are daunting, yet together they compound with implications for food, fuel and debt prices, geopolitics and climate. The resulting story is complicated, but one underscoring the importance of the kind of insights that our guest today is known for. So this morning, I'm pleased to welcome one of the best people in the world to make sense of this polycrisis, of the intersection of politics, economics, and security, an unusually perceptive expert on the complexity of our global political economy, and a colleague here at Carnegie who's a non-resident scholar, as well as a noted academic and professor at Columbia, Adam Toos. Adam is the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute at Columbia University. Previously, he taught at Yale University of Cambridge. I had the pleasure of meeting him about 10 years ago when he was a guest of my colleagues and me at Stanford presenting uh, some of his work on uh, German economic history. And I still remember the jaw-dropping experience of reading The Wages of Destruction, his brilliant analysis of the German economy in World War II. Adam is a prolific writer whose body of work includes several award-winning books, a must-read newsletter entitled Chartbook that many of us read, and regular columns in Foreign Policy Magazine and the Financial Times. Adam, thank you for the time and for being my colleague at Carnegie, and welcome. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here, Tim. Adam, I want to start with a, a paradox of sorts. On the one hand, as I alluded to earlier, prior to the pandemic, the measurable quality of human life on the planet had gotten to a point where it had never been better. On the one hand, you know, the uh, pandemic at least temporarily disrupted progress in many areas, compounding the negative trends we've seen in deepening economic inequality, uh, waning trust in democratic institutions, geopolitical competition. And yet, if you look at 50-year, 60-year long trends, the world has gotten richer and healthier. What do you make of a world that is paradoxically so much richer and in many ways more prosperous than it was 50 years ago, and yet also so replete with conflict, tension, disaffection, and a sense of crisis? Well, I think, first of all, a sense of quantitative proportion is crucial here. I mean, I think we have to take the numbers about living standards, life expectancy, infant mortality, maternal mortality, all of this like hardcore stuff about the human existence captured in statistics absolutely seriously. That is the bedrock anchoring phenomenon, the reality that the humans collectively have lived in the last half century. So if you take allow for wars and displacement and all of the other stuff and adjust, if you like, human qualitative life years by that, I still think, broadly speaking, we're on an uptrend. And the vast majority of people around the world over two generations have experienced steady improvement, in some cases, absolutely dramatic improvement. And if you have not experienced improvement, you're in a pretty small minority at this point. 
And, and that is a shocking experience, of course. The other thing to say is that when we use the term poly crisis, we're not talking about poly disaster or you know, the end of the world, right? This is a post-Malthusian concept. It is more, I think, about, if you like, the, the almost, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I'll say it for clarity's sake, the perception, if you like, of the world. I mean, or another way of putting it is that crisis, crises are things that happen are things that happen to people who are alive. It comes from the Greek medical terminology, and it's the course of an illness which reaches a crisis point. In other words, the patient's not dead yet. And so crisis is, if you like, a condition of struggling to manage and reaching a critical turning point. And the notion of polycrisis emphasizes the fact that those choices currently are plural, multiple, and very complex. It's not necessarily saying they're worse than they were in the before. I think if you think back to the 1970s and the array of crises that face Southeast Asia, for instance, or East Africa, or the Cold War and the risks there of actual confrontation, which were in many ways, I think, higher than they are still today. But they weren't perhaps compounding in quite the way that they are now. But to get to your question, I mean, how could this, how could we end up in such a miserable and tense situation despite all of this growth? I mean, I think there are different mechanisms that would explain this. I mean, one is that not everyone experiences the growth in the same way. And if you look within advanced economies, there has been massive increase in inequality. And there is also a widening gap between the global growing segment, which is about two thirds, and the segment which really hasn't grown very much, notably concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, which constitutes a kind of a pool of misery, a condition of immiseration in some cases, even downward trajectories, which are very extreme. So that's one potential driver. Even when you have convergent growth, as we are experiencing between China and the West, that too can become a source of conflict, right? That's the, that's the other kind of key motor here is that the liberal idea somehow that, you know, du commerce, the, the softness, the community of trade would lead towards peace is, I think, naive without the super and supervening politics and diplomacy to actually broker a peace, right? Just to rely on foreign direct investment or something like that to moderate political conflict between fundamentally different regimes is, is a liberal conceit and really nothing more than that. And that bluff has been called in the world that we're currently in. And now we're in a world with acknowledged conflict and massive entanglement. And that's kind of new in its own right. The third obvious element would be to say, well, many of the solutions, which we think of as the solution to the problem, which, say, Malthus first outlined in the early 19th century of the limits to growth, are now running up against those limits. For a long time, they allowed us to outrun environmental constraint in a spectacularly successful way. But all of the best science now tells us to a considerable extent as a warning about the future, but for hundreds of millions of people already as a present danger, that we are running up against those boundaries and the chickens are going to come home to roost on a huge scale. And this summer will be a test of that in many places in the world. We don't even need to elaborate. So that's the third reason. And the fourth is, I think, that if you look back over the last half century, there is progress in certain domains. It's uneven and in itself a source of conflict and in itself a source of problems. But there are also a handful of issues of regions, of areas where we have simply struggled and failed to provide any kind of resolution, thinking notably of the situation in Palestine right now in the Middle East. And problems unaddressed over a period of time don't remain the same. Some do, but many don't. They fester, they mutate, they become different, they become worse through the sheer disillusionment of people's historical understanding that they've been living with the problem since you know, the 1940s. And the failures of those moments then translate into new types of more aggressive, more apocalyptic kind of politics. I mean, think about the condition of Palestinians in the West Bank. You, how else would you think your situation except than in apocalyptic terms? And that leads from you know, the relatively conventional nationalism in the Arab world of the 1960s and early 1970s to the much harder to manage, live with, contemplate the future of Islamic radicalism of our generation, which points to much more apocalyptic options because it sees salvation outside the real world, ultimately. And that is a, a quite, you could argue, quite reasonable reflex of the, of the sense that really nothing will ever solve this problem. So those would be mechanisms, I, I think, through which you could see an overall success story not turning into a benign, calming scenario, but in some ways exacerbating the tension. Well, make an analytical observation that cuts across your four points and then yeah. a question that follows for policymakers and for institutions like ours. 
analytically, it highlights, I, I just highlight that you're describing a process through which part of what drives conflict is not only objective reality, of course, it's expectations. It's how people see themselves living relative yeah. to how others are living. It's their own sense yeah. of what is appropriate for them. And if that then gets overlaid on the climate crisis, for example, I mean, there are other ways to tell the story, but what I hear you saying is how could a policymaker representing millions of people in the developing world not take account of the fact that the development trajectory of countries like the United States, like Japan, Western Europe, all reflect a set of choices that were made at a time when burning carbon was much um, easier uh, from the policy perspective. It was not considered problematic. And now uh, we somehow face the prospect of bringing billions of people into the global middle class when the rules of the game are changing. And how can that not create a degree of resentment and frustration? So that's that's the analytical point. The, the policy question then is how to take account of that expectation and at the same time recognize that some of what has allowed the world to grow and increase its prosperity is now being questioned, including, for example, the degree of global economic integration. What do you make of that? How, how should thoughtful policymakers who want to be pragmatic about meeting the moment, but also don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, respond to that. Yeah. I mean, to go back to your very general point about identity, again, crisis is, ha is something that happens to an, an identity, right? Crisis doesn't happen to inert material. Crisis is almost constitutively a subject experience. It's a body, it's a person, it's a psychology, it's a polity, it's a nation, it's an ecosystem. Everything organic, if you like, anything that has life, I think, is capable of experiencing crisis. And so issues of identity are constitutive of it. You can also, therefore, to a degree, pursue a politics of identity which defines crisis out of existence. I mean, we saw many extraordinary examples of this within Europe, the way the French and the Germans, for instance, held, dealt with the Eurozone. The, you know, incredibly technical issue. In the German case, it became a matter of belief and identity, and the French just sort of brushed it under the table as a technical matter for bankers that could be sorted there. And that has huge consequences for how you deal. And this goes to the climate point, right? At what point does climate become a matter of global justice and injustice, at which point it's almost impossible to digest, right? Because the obvious demand would be that folks like ourselves immediately stop our lifestyles and then pay reparations in a very dramatic form. And in what way do you kind of do a realist, well, you know, bygones, we are where we are, we want a common solution, don't we? And how can we move the conversation to the relatively safe space, relatively safe space, because I'll come on to the quibbles here, or the issues here, of talking about solutions. And, and th then I think two things really intrude, which is, well, three things at least, right? So the solutions would be presumably that we redefine development in the terms of the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015 as being about forging a new green path for, for Africa, for sub-Saharan Africa in particular. That's clearly a huge, you know, on this, the future of one to two billion people depends and the conditions with which the African continent lives with its immediate neighbors in, in Western Asia and, and Europe. So that's the challenge and the idea is, okay, well then the good news is that we have a variety of energy options which we're rapidly developing on incredibly promising cost curves that at some point are going to make the energy provided that way cheaper than any energy we failed previously to provide to you in the fossil fuel age, right? Because it's not as though, as it were, Mali, for instance, was, was on a promising fossil fuel trajectory before it was interrupted by the insights of the Green Revolution. No, development had stalled, had failed for a complex variety of both external and internal reasons. That in turn had begun to produce in the Islamic insurgency across that belt an extraordinarily destructive, meaningful, but destructive kind of mobilization. And so you're operating into that space. And the promise now is that, in fact, solar and wind are incredibly well adapted to the African continent. It might very well emerge now. Anyone would have to say, and this is the next point, finally, you know, after 50 years of post-colonial development or 60 to 70 of post-colonial development and frustration and, of course, 100, 100 years of colonialism and 200 to 250 years of the incorporation into the slave trade as a site for development. So technology is there. The realization of a possibility is there. And the third element that then, as it were, is on the table and was put on the table at the conference in Paris recently is the question of finance, right? Because it's all very well to know that there could be technological solutions than to be able to sketch markets, possibilities, say for the export of hydrogen or, or ammonia or 
byproducts of those uh, raw iron or cement, for instance, the vision the Germans are cultivating in Namibia, for instance, right now, um, and many other people in, in hydrogen development in Africa. The, the, the next key element is, is finance to make, it, to make it possible. And finance is, as you know, any Keynesian, and I count myself as a Keynesian, will tell you, ultimately a matter of, a matter of technique. It's ultimately a matter of law and convention and political bargains. But you do have to put those laws and those conventions and those political bargains in place. And that's why the conversation is all about de-risking and the remodeling of the balance sheets of the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, and the possibility of the mobilization of private money on terms which are both reasonable and sustainable for the people who end up ultimately having to pay the debts back in the developing and low-income world, and for the taxpayers in the rich world, which have to de-risk this activity and have been, you know, spanned over a barrel repeatedly in a series of moves by big capital worldwide, which have had the effect of socializing the risks and the costs and the losses and privatizing the profits, which goes back to the 2008 experience. And so that's, I think, the space within which the conversation is happening. No one really imagines, I think, we're going to see gigantic green states or massive global new, new, new deals being pushed through the stressed budgets of the advanced economy world to the benefit of the developing world. But I think there is a dawning and I think pretty consolidated understanding now that unless we address investment needs at the level of several trillion dollars a year, four decades to come, we are steering open eyed. I mean, we, we may you know choose to look away, but our eyes are basically open into Disaster is perhaps an overreach, but really a catastrophic failure of potential. And the reality, of course, is that even when, if one closes one's eyes, the skin feels the heat at some level. Yeah, no, 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 no. The, the heat is coming and the, the, the disasters that will unfold in the Mediterranean, for instance, as we speak, almost on a daily basis of desperate, entrepreneurial, desperate, energized people trying to find a better life for themselves in the North and drowning. Um, the the irony is that so many of the issues you've, just raised now, though they are not about U.S.-China competition, in a few key national capitals, they're viewed largely through a lens of U.S.-China competition. And certainly, one cannot ignore that dimension to almost any serious discussion of reform of the international financial institutions, for example, or the global trading regime. And yet, it, you know, it, it also raises the question, if you, one pulls away from that perspective and wants to think about the world from the point of view of a number of powerful and important countries that are sometimes described with the term middle power, which may not quite fit anymore, but the Indonesias, the Egypts, the Brazils, yeah. the Turkeys, the Mexicos. What do you make of their reaction to this poly crisis, their economic policies, their political economy, and where is that going? And I think this is really an absolutely fundamental and it goes back also to the China-US competition. I mean, how do you view this emerging? It's not even emerging. The reality of multipolarity um, in, in the modern world. Um, you know, from the, from the point of view of recent shocks, so if you look at 2008, if you look at 2020, if you look at the years even in between, um, we do seem to be in a really rather new regime in the sense that the managerial capacities, the crisis facing capacities of uh, shall we call them the G20 or the G30? I, a middle doesn't, you know, to me doesn't really do it justice. Like, why would you call Turkey a middle power or an Indonesia? I mean, these are gigantic, hugely complex, you know, players uh, by, by any standard and certainly by their own reckoning, right? Um, their ability to withstand pressure of various types has dramatically increased and is a factor in itself to reckon with. Also in commentary, right? There's a limit to how often we can cry wolf about the impending prospect of a global debt crisis, invoking implicitly a story like the 1980s or the late 1990s in Asia. And I really just don't think that's ever coming anymore because look at Turkey. <laughs> I mean, you know, if a country was ever going to deliberately bring upon itself a crisis, it's Turkey. And it's not even in Argentina's position, not even close, right? So the capacity of states like that to harness the very considerable internal resources, both of their middle class, their business, their state apparatus, the desire of international capital to find locations to invest in, it, it changes the game very, very considerably. And I think the question really is for the, you know, what in that kind of schema get called the major, the big powers, not the middle powers, is, is how they relate to this. And I think there's really a very fundamental set of questions here. I mean, the Europeans 
to their credit, I think, have essentially announced that they embrace multipolarity. What, when they talk about de-risking, what they mean de-risking in their relations with China is not that they want to stop investing or trading with China. They just want to pluralize, multiply their potential partners in the world. So from their point of view, the existence of this multipolar sphere of very large, very significant emerging and middle income countries is nothing but a bonus. There's really no downside to it. And I think that's why we're seeing this new effort by the Europeans, for instance, to restart Merc the relationships with Mercosur, <coughs> build out these kind of relations, the ongoing dance they do with, with Turkey, for instance. And the huge interest there is now in cultivating relations with India are all part of that effort to actually make the best of multipolarity. China, of course, talks a good game of multipolarity. This is what they say and profess to want. It depends, I think, where you are in the world. If you're in the immediate vicinity of China, in the South China Sea, it feels pretty rough. But I think, broadly speaking, if you look at Latin America, they can quite credibly say that they have delivered on that, right? Nothing has, in a sense, empowered Brazil more in the last 20 years than its extraordinarily dynamic trading relationship with China. It's an incredible story, right? The surge in Latin American China trade over the last 20 years is is really a world historic development because it repolarizes the internal logic of the Western Hemisphere in a way that I think Washington has been quite asleep to, or that's a little unfair, but really struggles to provide an answer to. And that, in a sense, would be my question, is like, where does America actually stand on the multipolarity issue? Because again, of course, you know, in the Trumpian mode, um, you could say it's pretty clear. Trump wanted to do bargains. He'd do bargains with anyone. There was a sort of cynical multipolarity at work. He would deal with the Saudis. He would deal with the Russians. He would deal with Erdogan, man, manner and manner. It was kind of like a simple story. And it fitted with his apocalyptic story about American decline as well. I think actually for liberal Americans, the current Biden administration, which count, you know, I count many people in that were associated with it as my friends. I think in that sense for us, if you like, or at least for them, for these people, I think it's much more problematic because at one level, they would not deny, of course, the multipolar, tend multipolar tendency and would push against any claim that they want to exert a unipolar dominance or hegemony. But de facto, are very devoutly committed to the idea that America does have a exceptional position as a leader in the world and that without America's leadership, if you think about Blinken's opening statement, you know, whether we like it or not, the world doesn't organize itself. So America needs to come back to the table. Well, you know, people might differ about that, whether or not America, the world organizes itself in the absence of America. It kind of did, actually. And then the final element in the story now is, of course, that if you take the confrontation with China and ultimately the containment of China's rise under its current leadership as a historic mission of the Biden presidency, and they say so in so many words, then are you really committed to multipolarity or do you actually want to, to consolidate new alliances and a new bloc? Do you actually want to come and consolidate alliances of democracies? Do you want to define friends and enemies? How far do you want to you know, allow the play of sanctions to operate? So I think it's actually really, without wanting to foreclose on this, I think it's actually a rather profound dilemma for American policy. It's uh, fascinating. So, I mean, one subtext to all this, of course, is that there's a degree of connection between the domestic approach the Biden administration has taken and it, that particular mission you articulated globally yeah. that, that they might prioritize in domestic investment and so on, and raises interesting questions of implementation and how effectively government institutions can deliver on that. But another subtext or subplot here uh, is about technology, because if we go back 30, 40 years, it, it does seem like certain perspectives on trade might have played down the distinction between different things you might trade. And here, you know, if, if I'm trying to decode a little bit the Biden administration's approach, there's a particular sensitivity around technology, access to it, its long-term impact on economic, political, and military power, and uh, the perhaps um, greater uh, desire to have countries sort of choose whether they're going to treat uh, China, let's say, as a, as a legitimate provider of like deep technological infrastructure. And you know, the Biden administration might point out that there are various risks that countries have to take seriously, in that sort of decision making. But it does raise this interesting question of how much the current moment is defined by a special kind of technological competition 
And, uh, you know, certainly AI being in the news highlights and underscores this discussion, but it's about semiconductors, it's about 5G. What do you make of all that? I think this is a really fascinating dimension. I mean, as a historian, I feel I should probably say that it's not it's not radically new in the sense that during the first Cold War with the Soviet Union, after all, technology was also an issue very much, actually, especially in transatlantic relations with the Europeans. The succession of American administrations looked askance at the willingness, notably, of German industrial companies to do business in the Soviet Union and supply what was regarded as sensitive technology. And there was a long list, also including early microelectronics, avionics, and this kind of thing, of goods which were absolutely prohibited in trade with the Soviet Union. And, and NATO coordinated this. Uh, you know, it was, it was a precursor to our current moment. I think the big, the huge difference is there are multiple, I think, is A, the current um, disenchantment and the current effort to de-risk and disentangle and decouple comes against the backdrop of 20 to 30 years of unprecedented integration, um, which is very unlike the relations that anyone ever had with the Soviet Union. Um, secondly, China is a much more significant player in its own right in the technological space than the Soviet Union was in any, I mean, the Soviet Union, of course, had areas of excellence. Nuclear technology, despite Chernobyl, still is a dominant, where Russia totally dominates in the global energy and nuclear business, okay. um, military hardware, and in space, right? So in those were areas where the Soviet Union was, in fact, world beating. Um, but China is in a, you know, infinitely more powerful position. And more broadly, I think, one would have to say that tech has come to play an outsized role in our lives over this last half century. And so the combination of those three things means that this issue between China and the US is much, much more pervasive, much more tricky, much more complicated to sort out. And that Taiwan of all places should become, as it were, you know, it's this, because that's technology that we still really don't know whether you can do large scale three nanometer production of anything anywhere outside yeah. Taiwan. It's just not obvious you can, right? And if that's the case, it's really a kind of world historic. It's as though world history came to revolve around the white wine vineyards of Burgundy. Like, what would we do if that was the case? Um, it's a- uh, And Adam, how world. ironic that if you go back even just 20 years, the promise yeah. of technology was taken to be an utter disruption of the significance yeah. of geography, right? Yeah, exactly. It would disrupt geography and it would disrupt boundaries. And I think, you know, to be honest, of course, Apple, the single most valuable company that has ever been in the entire economy ever, lived that model and and has is goes on living it not in the sense that geography doesn't matter but that it straddles geographies and articulates them with each other and builds geographies and you know the 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 hope is in a sense to make viable this alternative vision that you can replicate that but but if so it's a long shot we've not done that before and it will certainly involve a lot of disentangling um it's truly striking to me that the new headset that Apple has introduced, you know, this breakthrough technology and the, the, that's, the supply chain for that is entirely Chinese again. <laughs> so even yeah. in this moment, um, it's, really that's a, it's a telling factoid as, in as much as, I mean, not a factoid, just, I mean, just a, a, a case study in as much as so much discussion about deglobalization or even about reglobalization without China fails to recognize that at least some American companies are still making bets to some degree that those supply chains will be viable. Uh, I mean, maybe yeah, Apple has- That really stuff. understates it. The most valuable company in the American stock market, the most right. valuable company ever, the most valuable American company ever, is wholly committed to the prospect of being able to, and has no plan B as far as anyone's able to tell. I mean, the India story is out there, but like has no plan B, still really doesn't have a plan B. So we're going to go to questions in a moment from the audience, but I want to ask you maybe one last query or family of queries before we go to those questions. And it's about the changing nature of economic ideas, which is something you've written about, thought about quite a bit. So if I take the Fed's recent actions, we've had like a 500 basis point increase in tightened monetary policy to a first approximation. And yet, you know, the U.S. economy hasn't really felt it that much. Some investors just observe that there's good reason to think that a lot of the models people carry around in their heads or in their computers to estimate the connection between, for example, monetary policy and economic growth and employment seem not so functional and accurate. And if I generalize that point to just how much of this poly crisis has produced uh, 
responses from quantitative easing to the massive amount of German subsidies, the energy um, uh, prices and so on. What do you make of that shift in the Overton window, as it were, with respect to what counts as responsible economic policy? And as somebody who just described yourself as a Keynesian, what do you take to be the limits of responsible you know, macroeconomic policy making from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, this is a, another fantastic and huge question. I mean, at one level, you know, I think there are two different views. One would be to say that at, at, at some level, we live in a fairly unchanged world, really, in the same thing. I mean, John Williams gave this quite vigorous defense of the Fed's position in the pages of the FT today or yesterday in a long interview with Colby Smith. Um, in which he basically said, you know, just give it some time. This is going to work its way through. Yes, you know, a 5% interest in interest rates will in the end slow the American economy down. It is slowing down. It'll just take some time. And I think that's a very reasonable position. And it's broadly could be articulated within in the, you know, the kind of new Keynesian framework that has dominated American and global policy economics de facto since the 1980s. And we are in an extraordinarily unusual and to call it a standard business cycle, I think is quite misguided. We are still unraveling the truly remarkable shocks of 2020. And then in the European case, the energy shock of last year, which was epic by any standards. So this is very complicated. The toolkit is working at some level. It's slower than people anticipated, but I don't really see any need to declare a revolution. On the other hand, on the industrial policy side, we absolutely have seen an opening of the Overton window. Some would say a Pandora's box, right? In the sense that the old belief that picking winners using government money to deliberately, you know, structure industrial policy, um, that taboo has disappeared and, and people are engaged in it. I mean, I think, and that, that's important. I think there are three things to say about that are really worth saying. It was always a bit of a myth that industrial policy didn't exist. It was something that folks who identified as hardcore neoliberals told each other. But just fly in any airplane anywhere in the world, and you are flying in the product of massive industrial policy, whether Boeing or Airbus, what else is it, right? Drive any car in the world. If it's a turbo diesel, it's the effect of a certain rather discreet European industrial policy that's running that way. Secondly, if you dig into the actual techniques that are being used in the IRA, somebody like Daniel Agarbo will say they're actually rather familiar, hands-off, public-private partnership kind of de-risking packages. So plus a change, we're really still in that, in, that, in that old world. And I think that would suggest that at some level, you know, we're not, we're not really paradigm broken so much as modifying, progressively modifying where I do see a really radical change is simply in the ambition. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act is, after all, simultaneously trying to address the climate crisis, address China, and fix the American middle class and thus secure democracy and the future of the American Republic with a, you know, a policy dimensioned at the scale of about half a trillion dollars. Um, and following in the wake of previous policies that were dimensioned in the scale of several trillion dollars. And that, I think, is really the quite fundamental break. It's not so much that economic policy per se is radically different or that, the, you know, at some level the problems aren't familiar because deciding you're going to do industrial policy doesn't mean you actually know how to pick winners. It just means you're going to take the gamble and probably fail in many ways you anticipated. But you're at least trying. Why are you trying? Because these urgencies are so extreme. And the very least you can say about the Biden administration is they're super smart people who totally see, recognize, and fully, I think, understand the gravity of those challenges and are trying to formulate policy to react within the limits of what American democracy and the you know, very fine balance in Congress will permit them to do. It's an amazingly impressive, at one level, dauntingly, you know, people call it a Swiss army knife for a reason, because the thing about a Swiss army knife is it's a pen knife. You know, if you're relying on a Swiss army knife to confront world historic challenges, well, good luck to you, brave person. <laughs> like, you know, go for it, Godspeed. But it's a pen, you know, it's a pen knife with a lot of different attachments. It's a very legitimate answer. Let me just push you a little bit on it. Imagine yourself as the designer of that Swiss Army knife and uh, somebody who either had to advise a president or, or advising the people advising the president about when the knife got so crowded with too many tools that it would just be not something yeah. you can put it in your pocket. So like the notion of picking winners and losers, which is a, a bit of a, uh, you know, uh, one framework for thinking about why industrial policy gets tricky. There are elements of that that probably your analytical work would push back on and say it happens all the time. But where would you maybe see like 
okay, there's a limit. I would not want even a responsible government I generally trust to take on quite that much because I doubt it would work. For me, actually, it's the bit which is biggest, and it's the microchip story. Like, I don't, I, un, I mean, it, that seems to me, let's put it this way. It, it's, it's the area which is most clearly driven by geopolitical military logic at some level, I think. Though people who really know this stuff tell you that China can find a way around almost all other problems on AI. You just make slightly less efficient, therefore slightly hotter or slower driving engines. But it may even encourage the Chinese to do more algorithmic stuff, which will ultimately make their stuff smarter than ours. But in any case, that for me is the real rub. Because if you had to pick an industry that you would not wish to attempt to manipulate with government policy, it would be the microchip industry. It is just epically, mind-blowingly, unbelievably capital intense. Like Samsung's quarterly investment budget runs into tens of billions of dollars. There is only one company that has so far managed to do really large-scale mass production at the three nanometer level. You've already, you already know who the winners and the losers are. Insofar as you're backing Intel, you're backing a company which has demonstrably failed to make the leap into the new level of technology because it didn't understand the significance of lithography and is now at the next level trying to make up for that. You know, if you looked at the industrial policy history book, you'd say this looks like a really bad bet. But if you look at the numbers, which the Biden administration is celebrating now for the surge in investment in manufacturing, where is it? Of course, it's in that sector because building the plants is so incredibly expensive. So it's to me like and so it's a real that's where you really see the hard trade off between the supposed geopolitical logic and the, the likely success story in terms of economics and also Ultimately, this isn't just money out the window, right? This is a this is something you have to legitimate to the public. You have to justify to taxpayers. You have to seriously ask, why are we, you know, in the German case, why are we spending 10 billion euros to subsidize an Intel plan when Germany is screaming and crying out for investment in God knows how many other areas? It's justified in terms of security. How many brigade uh, battle groups would Germany actually be able to provide to the Baltic if it spent 10 billion rapidly building? Then I think it's in the order of three or four, maybe, which would enormously increase its you know, contribution to NATO and any conventional understanding of security, much more than building this chip plant. So it's, it's, these are really serious trade-offs, and that will be the one I would focus on. That's laudably specific. We have a couple questions from the audience about the long-term impact of the war in Ukraine. Say a bit about what scenarios you imagine playing out, particularly if we take into account not only the hot war, as it were, but the challenge of rebuilding the economy of Ukraine, dealing with the various issues of corruption and, and social well-being there as well, long term. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously the the absolute, the real sort of shock um, experience. I mean, in A, in the sense of Russian's aggression, and then the positive shock of the extraordinary resilience the Ukrainians have shown. The upshot of that is that we now face this, I mean, I think, in my memory, unprecedented situation where you have a, a, a real war, not a, you know, not a war, which is a war of choice, where we basically know the outcome. And the question is whether the US military can suppress the insurgency, but a full on fully contingent existential struggle between two, what turn out to be two rather significant military powers, one of which has the second nuclear arsenal in the world, like we have not confronted a jeopardy of that type before. And it's, it's really extraordinarily serious in its implications. And the short answer is we simply don't know yet what the outcome of this is going to be, because we don't know how the war is going to be concluded. I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult, I think, to, 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 sh to, to really map out any... Well, the, so the, the scenario that many people would tout as the good scenario, which will be a crushing Ukrainian victory, exposes us to the huge question of what happens next to the Russian state. And if you don't go down that route, then the question is, how on earth do we broker a peace which could be acceptable to Ukrainian democracy after the sacrifices, heroism, and success they've achieved so far, but it's limited. It's not conclusive. It hasn't given them what they want in Crimea or, you know, the Eastern Territories back. And this offensive, I'm, you know, I'm not a day to day military expert, but it doesn't look like a kind of breakthrough operation of the type. And there was no real reason to expect they could perform that again against the settled Russian defense. So I think it's incredibly difficult to see how this has good outcomes anytime soon. And the consequences of that, well, for the global economy, I think at this point, they're largely cauterized. They're, they're priced in to an extent and they're largely, they're largely cauterized. <laughs> Ukraine's question is of survival uh, on the economic front as well as on the battlefield. 
and whatever partial reconstruction they can get done and need to get done to see them through another year of war, I think, at this point. Um, and the really pressing issue, um, one that needs to be urged, I think, also in the public mind, is where the US stands on that, because the US was absolutely critical in the first phase of the war, and the level of American support is like no one else has given. Um, but the real question here is, from the economic point of view, is is there any willingness on the American part to match, say, the European offer of 50, Euro, 50 billion euros over a, over a, a, the next, uh, till 2027 it is, isn't it, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of package? Because what Ukraine desperately needs is stability in its, in its financing. And without that, they risk tumbling into acute IMF dependency, emergency bailout packages over the course of this fall or coming into the winter. And the question is, is America just holding back? Because America's not made that matching commitment this time around to what the Europeans have. Does the Americans have another plan in mind? Is this a matter of political tactics on the part of the Biden administration that they don't dare to ask Congress? It's not in, as far as I can tell, in Biden's budget that was announced in the spring. I think there's $7 billion in there for Ukraine. That's not, that's not enough. That's nowhere near the ballpark we need to be at. So where is that answer going to come from, given the shifting political mood in the US on this issue and the upcoming elections? And so that, you know, you know, even even the I mean, the prospect of a prolonged war from the Ukraine, from Ukraine's point of view must be terrifying in absolutely every respect. And you can see why they are so urgently and dramatically and with extraordinary. I mean, if you've been in any of the meetings personally with the Ukrainian side and their allies in Eastern Europe, it's a kind of moral pressure that I've never experienced in a public setting before. I mean, it's it's really dramatic. And I that's that for me raises another question is how do they digest what I fear is going to be and expect to be their disappointment? Because America, for very good reasons, is I think holding back for making very extensive promises on NATO membership anytime soon. For you know, because because America has to make these awesome has has the awesome responsibility of wielding the nuclear deterrent and and needs to guard that and needs to protect itself. And Biden has been admirably forthright, I think, in in spelling out the limits of what he's willing to do. But how then does Ukraine, given this massive mobilization of public opinion, how do they digest the the upcoming disappointment? I don't I I'm very I have I have I, I have only um bleak and worried um, feelings and thoughts about that century. Yeah, that's perceptive. Sometimes intellectual honesty requires us to just uh, acknowledge the scale of the problem. But in particular, I also acknowledge your point about how difficult it is to be completely dispassionate about what's happening. Ultimately, all of us who are in the position of being interpreters of what's happening in the world are called upon to be uh, mindful of objectivity and of the need to be very practical and realistic. But at the same time, there is a moral and ethical dimension that's impossible to ignore. We have an initiative here trying to think about some of these very issues around how to rebuild Ukraine, how to guarantee its security. And uh, it implicates a lot of the dilemmas you realize, you, you've, um, you've shared. There's a question about 1914 and discussions that sometimes highlight structural similarities between the current moment and 1914. What do you make of that, Adam? Um, I mean, I... I uh... The, the, the most important thing to say, to my mind, as a historian, is, is that um, we're, in a different, we're in a different world. I mean, you know, structurally, it may make sense to, to analogize, I don't know, between the British Empire and the, rising, and the rising power of imperial Germany. America, you know, what we actually confront is something far more radical, right? Because, because China isn't just a medium-sized European nation state doing its thing. China is, at this point, by far, by a very, very large margin, the single most populous and powerful state our species has ever produced. Full stop. No, no, no society has ever previously managed to organize 1.4 billion people at the level that China currently does. And if that's the rising power, no rising power like that has ever confronted an incumbent as powerful and as well-armed and as convinced of its righteous, you know, exceptional role in leadership as the United States. I mean, the British Empire looks mild by comparison and certainly vastly less potent than the United States is. I mean, it was the first and only true old style, you know, it was both an empire and radically global, but the United States is something very different, right? It is a, it's a global nation state with, with, a, with a, a system of global reach that, that no state has ever previously matched. So in this respect, 
I find those analogies, I mean, they're not, after all, they're hardly reassuring to compare the current situation to 1914, but they don't really actually capture what ought to be both the terror and the horror of our current moment, right? To me, the prospect of a war between China and the United States is... It's just, it's, it's utter, I mean, go back to your point you just made, you know, it's, I find it outrageous that it is actually the subject of daily conversation and wargaming and scenario planning and matter of fact preparation in the way that it has become in recent years. And I think you saw over the course of the first six months of this year, within very responsible centers in the Biden administration, also a sense of alarm about just how concrete it had become and how like 1914 it was beginning to feel. And we saw, and we've seen after all with the visits by both Blinken and, and Yellen to China, efforts to manage the tension in a way that are quite new and very significant, I think. They may not yield any positive constructive outcome, but the sheer presence of Secretary Yellen and Secretary of State Blinken in China is in of itself significant compared to where we were 12 months ago. Um, but I really think we shouldn't and I mean this seriously, we shouldn't reassure ourselves by, you know, by comparing this situation to 1914. We need to grasp that this is, you know, this is the checkerboard is now full, right? With China's development and India's development, this is it. This is the globe. The frontier is closed. These are the big units which are going to play out. If we are seriously going to play out and, and contemplate a future in which war between those units is possible, it is an unspeakably bleak outlook. Adam, when, when the editors pull out the, the money quote from this discussion you and I have been having, I suspect it will be, we shouldn't reassure ourselves by comparing today to 1914. Mm. Uh, last question for you. You have an uncommon uh, insight from my perspective into subtlety and the things that maybe the rest of the world hasn't quite grasped yet that need attention. We've covered a lot of topics some of which are getting plenty of attention, some less attention. Tell us about one trend, region, problem that you think deserves more attention and isn't getting it right now. Well, I mean, <laughs> I actually want to, I mean, we've been specific on quite a number of points. I hope you forgive me if I don't give you a specific answer on this, but give you a very general one, which goes back and links directly to what I've just said, which is that, that it's meaningful to say what I've just said, which is that we shouldn't reassure ourselves by comparing our current situation to that of 1914, goes to this point that we, we have to grapple as best we can with, the, with a truly awesome realization that this time is quite fundamentally different and on a scale and at a pace and with consequences of irreversibility that are simply you know, unprecedented in our collective history in modern times. That's what the climate diagnosis when taken seriously means. And yet what I see, you know, in, in well-meaning conversations again and again and again with folks that one has these conversations with are these moves which position it back in a history that we've already experienced. Like, like you know, classically people will ask, okay, so we've got to do the energy transition. Tell me what the precedents are for doing energy transitions. To which the answer is, there are no precedents to doing the energy transition. In fact, we've never, ever done an energy transition, ever. I mean, you can imagine the energy transition as being, you know, horse and buggy, railway train, motor vehicle, aircraft. But if you look at humanity's global use of energy, we didn't transition out of anything ever. We've just progressively increased our consumption of everything, right? So what we're, what we're planning to do in a kind of matter-of-fact way the crucial thing to understand about it is it doesn't have any precedence at all ever in our collective experience. We have never simultaneously repressed the use of three major sources of energy, fossil or not, you know, because we have increased our consumption of wood and biofuels over time consistently. Animal power is the one thing that we've reduced use of for traction, but we eat more animals than ever before. So the herds of animals are getting bigger and bigger, but we have never shut down the use of coal, oil, gas, and essentially beef has to go too in the space of 20 to 30 years. And that's the, the, the thing that we don't, and in a sense, we need to shield ourselves against this realization because it is so deeply just vertiginous, is that none of this, there is no roadmap for any of this. And, and, and what we're embarking on therefore, and we need to do it at extraordinary speed, like 7% per annum reduction in CO2 emissions. That's one and a half percent per quarter, every single quarter for 30 years. This is like running 
a rapidly growing business in the other direction or a business which is totally changing its business model over 30 years, right? And I don't think that is really, that is something that I feel we just have to repeat to ourselves. It's not something we're just going to understand. It's something like a practice almost that you have to internalize this, wake up in the morning and go, we are in an unprecedented situation. Yes, I'm not crazy. I'm not radical. I'm not out with the, you know, the fairies like imagining this. We genuinely are. And tomorrow will be extreme and different again as well. And on and on for the rest of our lives, our children's and our grandchildren's lives. Adam, one of the uses of history that I think is underappreciated is underscoring where yep. history runs out as an analogy. And I appreciate that, 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 that note. And if anything, it reaffirms the importance of our mission. I'm very glad to call you a colleague. I look forward to more dialogues and thank you for all your insights today. Thank you, Tina, as well. Thank you to the whole team.